Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Greystone. My name is Joe Straup, and I'm the associate pastor. And it is so good for us to gather together and to be reminded of the good things that God has done. We're glad that you're here. And if you're joining us for the very first time, I especially want to thank you for being here. Or even if you're coming for the first time in a long time, we're extra glad that you're here. And there is a little white card in the back of the pew. That's our Connect card. And we would just love if you would fill that out. Let us know how we can be praying for you and how we can come alongside and serve you. It's not so we can send you a bunch of emails you don't want, but so that we can communicate with you ways that we can come alongside you and invite you into the life of the church that's so much bigger than just an hour on a Sunday morning. So we're so glad that you're here, but we'd love to serve you. Uh, There are a couple things that are coming up in the life of the church that I want to make sure that we are aware of and on the same page with. And so if you didn't get an announcement sheet on your way in, I encourage you to grab one on your way out so that you can be looking at some of the things that are coming up and knowing how you can step in uh, to the life of the church in a bigger way. Um, The first is that this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock is the event that our pep ministry is hosting. We're having Mark Cable, who's a Christian comedian, coming in. Uh, And if you did not register for the dinner, the dinner starts at 6 o'clock, but if you didn't sign up already, it is too late. I am sorry. We had to tell the caterer to buy certain things. Um, There's a whole bunch of us who are going to be here, which is wonderful, but... Even if you missed that deadline, you can still come for the time together for the comedian. Um, That's going to be 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, so you don't have to RSVP for that. You can just show up, and we would love to have you to be here, to laugh together, to enjoy that time. Uh, It's a gift that Pep is putting that together for us, and we're excited to be able to do that as well. Um, And we have another opportunity at the end of the week. So one week from today is our youth spaghetti dinner and basket auction fundraiser to raise money for our mission trip going to Cleveland, Ohio this summer. It's always a wonderful chance to gather together to eat a spaghetti meal, as well as just to hear stories from last year's mission trip uh, and to be encouraged in what God's going to do as we go to serve others in the name of Jesus. Uh, But it's also a great time to uh, support the work that they're doing. And you can do that in a couple ways. One is by putting together a basket for folks to bid on. Um, We generally say a $25 value, and you can bring that by next Sunday, um, and then we'll have those ready to go for the auction. You can come and bid on them, um, because we have some really fun goodies uh, that people put together, and that uh, the auction is half the fun uh, of just doing that together. You could also come, just make a donation uh, towards the, the kids if you're like, I don't need to take anything home, I just want to help the kids. Um, but even if that's not an option, you can still come, hear these stories, and just pray for these kids um, to learn more about what God is going to do and to come alongside them as a prayer partner. So we'd love for you to be there. It's from 5 o'clock to 8 next Sunday. Uh, Generally finishes before 8, but we'd love to have you join us for that time. When it comes to opportunities for us to serve, um, there's another one that I wanted to make sure I drew our attention to because one of the local mission partners who we come alongside is Family Promise. That's a ministry here in our community that cares for those who are experiencing homelessness. And we have an opportunity to come alongside of them by providing meals. And that would be starting on April 22nd. Uh, for a couple weeks. And so we would love, uh, if you can sign up to do that, we've got a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center, or you can contact Heather Ash um, just to know more about that. The bulletin has details on how to take a next step to step in and provide a meal for a family who could really use some help. Um, This is a great chance for us to be the arms and hands of Jesus for people, loving them in his name by meeting a real need. Uh, And that's a great segue into our one thing for today. Because every week we try to draw attention to one thing that we want to make sure everybody knows about. And so one thing that I just wanted to share and celebrate is last Sunday, Pastor Rob invited us into an opportunity that we have as a church. That over the summer we've been, we have this chance to be a place where food will be distributed for families, particularly children, who that access to food is a concern. And so we said, this is a great idea. This is a wonderful opportunity. We got this great outdoor ministry center. But if Greystone doesn't do it, we're not going to do it. If the church doesn't own it, it's not of the Lord. And boy, do you want to do it. Um, Over the course of the first service and the second service of last week and into the week, over 44 people stepped in to, to help out as either site supervisors to get trained or to be here on those days when we're distributing meals or to help out in various different ways. So good job. Um, You guys have said, this is the thing we want to do, so we're going to do it. Um, And it's not too late. It's the kind of thing, if you'd still like to be involved, you can reach out to Pastor Rob or myself, Sherry Costello in the church office, and we'll make sure that there's a place for you to to help out in a significant way. Uh, It's just awesome to be able to see that opportunity and to get a sense that this is a church that wants to meet a need. 
specifically in Jesus' name. And so we're excited that that's, that's the direction that we're moving as a church family. So uh, we're, we're excited about that. And I, get, I love getting to brag on y'all. So that's just good times. But the reason that we come together is not just all these programs and activities and things that we do. It's in response. And that response is worship because of the things that God has done. Because he has been so good and merciful and faithful to us as his people. That's what prompts us to come together. And so as we worship the Lord, I want us to take a moment to prepare our hearts and our minds to hear from him. So would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you that we can gather as your children, as a family of brothers and sisters united in Jesus so that we can hear the truth of your word, so that we can sing songs that stir our hearts towards the truth of your character, that, Lord, as we come to you in prayer as a body in need of you, Lord, we pray that in this time this morning, you would use this as a space for us to be transformed, to be aware of you in a deeper, more powerful way, and that because of who you are, we would walk away changed, and in awe and wonder of you. So Lord, we thank you that we can gather as your people and we pray that you would guide our hearts and our minds towards you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand for this morning's call to worship? Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. And that's what we proclaim when we come together and sing. And so as his people, let's come together, let's lift our voices, let's worship God together.
like Pastor Joe said, we, we come in worship to respond to God. And after a song like that, it's great to be really energetic and thankful to God for all the wonderful things he's done for us, the blessings that we appreciate and the things that sometimes, unfortunately, we take for granted. Nehemiah talks about praising God for all the things that he's done, for the oceans, for all of creation. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful thing for us to get, get together and do that. But we also need to respond to God in worship for what he did for us in those other ways. The things that we don't just look out and see, but the things that it cost him, which was his son. Continue worshiping.
Praising God with sing, by singing hallelujah is wonderful to do as a group. It's also wonderful to praise him as we together come to him in prayer. So please join with me as we pray. Almighty God, when we think about what you did, how you made this earth, everything in it, down to us, and you knew us at the beginning of creation, we can't help but say thank you and praise you and hallelujah. You had a plan for everything. Unfortunately, we stepped in and we broke that plan by sinning. Father, all of us sin. That doesn't leave us as sinners because you knew that that would happen and your plan included your son Jesus coming to this earth, rising from the dead and washing our sins as white as snow. Father, hear us as we silently confess our sins. Father, forgive us for the things that we do that are against your will, against loving other people, against serving them. Father, forgive us for not clothing the least of these, for not feeding our neighbors, for not sharing your good news when you called us to do that. But God, we're grateful that our sins have been forgiven because of what your son did for us. So let us continue worshiping by hearing from your, your gospel, hearing your good news. Quicken our hearts to be able to share that good news with everyone that we meet today and moving forward so that your name can be raised on high and you can be given the glory that you deserve. We ask all these things in your mighty name. Amen. And it's because of what Jesus did for us that we can have that peace with God to approach him and to ask for forgiveness. May the peace of Christ be with you. Share that peace with each other. Chile. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live in unity, when we as a body come together to demonstrate the love of Christ in each other, especially as we have one generation commending to the next the good news of what God has done. It's a gift that we have kids to be a part of our service time. It's also a gift that we have space for kids to learn and to grow. So this is the part of the service where kids who are preschool through elementary, welcome to head on downstairs with Jason for a time where they get to sing and to learn and to study. We love having them with us, and it's a joy that they get to be a part of this body. Um, so over, I, this week, I, before I invite Rob up to preach, um, one of the things that was also a gift is that I bring greetings from the brothers and sisters of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church all over our country. This week, I was in St. Louis, Missouri for a Next Generation Ministry Summit where we had leaders of Next Gen Ministry from all over the country. We had folks from up east. We had folks from down in Alabama. We had folks from Washington State and in, in California, Kansas City, all over. We had 13 out of 16 presbyteries there. Uh, and as the, one of the chairs of the Next Gen Council, I got to be a part of that conversation, leading that space. Uh, and it was a gift. And while we were there, uh, the chair before me was, came as a participant. He's a student ministries pastor in Memphis, Tennessee. And he has a gift for spoken word. And during that time, he shared a poem that he had written. 
And it just so happened to be about the topic we're talking about today. And so I said, Greg, can I have your poem? And can I share it with my church family at home? And he said, yes. So uh, it doesn't have a title, but this, uh, this poem is written by Greg Ott, who is a pastor in our presbytery. Can I put this another way for you? Because here we are talking about poetry. I'm not one of the pros. I need more than prose. Meter and rhythm and rhyme inspired by the God above time demand loftier speech that only poetry can reach. Listen to the beat of poetry's meter. The rhythm of your life is sure, just like the tides upon the shore. So when this poem's metaphor, its meter, rhyme, and beat secure, you feel its draw and its allure. But when you run, when you feel bored, your timing becomes less than pure. Rhythm fractured, meter broken, emphasis wrong, busy and without breaks, your life injured. Sounds weird, right? When the rhythm of your life is a bit off with no time off, then come trial and strife. Like legless dogs, our days have no pause. The noise and play every moment claims. It's like Monopoly. We're playing board games. Or feel this with me. Try to heal this with me by realizing with me what our days are like when we schedule them tight. No break in sight. When that rhythm attacks, there ain't no going back. We fill up every gap with distraction and action and act on every impulse and reaction. To pack on the simple, no inaction in our day. Can't afford them, so we just delete the boredom until it's busy, busy, busy. Your mind is in a tizzy. To-dos become your master when the pace keeps getting faster and your soul begins to ache at the rhythm your life takes. So please, for heaven's sake, would you just take a break? A moment to linger, a moment to sing, or just be still, attentive to his will. Sit with your creator, waste time with your savior. With your God, dwell and learn to be bored well. If every moment of inaction has us reaching for distraction, we'll never find that satisfaction with the gospel's great transaction. Let me say it again for the people in the loft. We'd rather our hearts be numb than soft. We see boredom and run because in the quiet come questions that haunt, shame that taunts. Are you enough? Can you do enough? How do we find rest? If boredom is only a test, a test of our identity, a test of our security, a test of our comfort with our relative obscurity, we need a better way. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. The Salah, the Sabbath, the rest for your soul. His grace can give you peace and make your salvation whole. You can be with yourself when he is with you. You can rest in the boredom if the gospel is true. So plan for the boredom, and on your Savior wait. Be ready to serve him and slow your frantic rate in your life and ministry. Set the bar low like the first rung of a ladder. Be boring, be slow, because you're present in the present. Your local in the mundane can show your people your posture rather than excite and entertain. See, disruptions are not interruptions. They're intermissions for your inner mission. Want to get rid of the stress and clean up the mess, the chaos address? Your king confess his grace access and others bless? Selah. Say less. Thank you, brother. Well, we have finished our focus on the book of Mark, and we're moving into a new sermon series, focusing on living in his abundance. Here, Joe, something stuck. Joe was like Rob passionate up there, and everything went haywire. <laughs> we're focusing the next five weeks on living in his abundance. Thank you, sir. For in John 10.10, 10, Jesus is talking, well, first in John 10, he's talking about being the good shepherd of the sheep. And he talks about being the gate. And, and in ancient Israel, it's interesting, when we think of a sheep pen, we think of the pen 
And the opening was not actually a closable gate. The shepherd would lay there. So he was the gate for the sheep. But then he talks about a thief. A thief comes only to kill and destroy. But I, Jesus says, as the good shepherd, have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Now, over the next five weeks, we're not going to talk about how if you come to know Jesus, you'll have more money than you need, you'll always be healthy, things will be wonderful. No. But we're going to talk about this life in abundance. See, abundance, spiritual abundance, is life eternal. So it's life eternal, but it's also knowing Jesus in his fullness today. See, we know his peace, his joy, his hope, his rest, his life today and it spills over our spiritual life spills over into our everyday walking around life the way that we treat people the way that we deal with money the entertainment we look at but also how we view time which is what we're going to look at today Jesus has come to teach us and to empower us how to live life in the fullness as only he can as we walk with him. This abundant life is living life to the fullest, not just merely existing or simply trying to make a living. There are many who are in this monotony of life. They get up, they go to work, or they go to class They follow a pattern and they live for the weekend only if they could take every hour of the weekend and and wring it dry only for Sunday night to be prepared and feeling down to get ready for Monday morning again. I think of a friend who deals with accounting who said to me a couple months ago, it feels like I care more about other people's money than they do. And there has to be something more than just doing taxes. See, Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, don't worry about our life. What we'll eat or drink or what we'll wear, which is what causes the monotony. Abundant life is not necessarily a life of comfort. See, we need to understand that. When we think of abundance, a lot of times we think of comfort. No, this abundant life that he gives, living life to the fullest, knowing his peace and joy and hope and love and life and rest, it doesn't matter what's going on around us. It doesn't matter if times are good or hard, if you're healthy or if you're sick. The abundant life that he guides us to, walking with him through this life, is not dependent on outside circumstances. But Jesus is also not giving us a new law. Some can say, well, Jesus wants me to live an abundant life. How do I do that? And we feel more burdened. No. This is about knowing him. In the midst of it, he gives it to us as a gift. You notice he doesn't say, I have come so that they can achieve abundant life. No. I have come to give abundant life. So as we walk with him, he will give us this abundant life, knowing his life to the fullness as we love God and we love others and we see him doing more than we could ask or imagine. This was an ancient Jewish perspective. When they would have read uh, John 10.10 and thought of abundant life, their entire life revolved around this teaching in Deuteronomy of the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus would have prayed this four times a day, walking with his disciples. Picture that, them walking and just saying this over and over again. Because the Jewish people believed that at any time we do the smallest thing to love God or love our neighbor... We cause the kingdom of God to come down to the ground. That's what we're talking about. As we follow Jesus and he teaches us to love God and others, the kingdom of God, we will see him at work in us and through us. And that's a thing of abundance. See, my friends, we have a choice. We can either be like the tree on the left that isn't growing It just does what it does and eventually wears out and dies. Or we can plug in to Jesus, walking with him through life, 
and knowing a life in abundance that even if storms come, and they will come, we can still live life to the fullest. We can still be flourishing. But here's the thing. The enemy hates that teaching. He hates us to think that God is one that gives life. He wants us to believe that God's the one who takes life because God puts rules around life and we should be our own gods in charge of our own life. And he tells us that God's ways will only lead to monotony and misery. But that's not true. He has come to give us abundant life. As I was preparing for this sermon, I came across a video clip from the Lord of the Rings that really addresses this. I have only seen the Lord of the Ring movies. I have not read the books, but I am blessed to have a close, close friend and a partner in ministry in Pastor Joe, who is an aficionado of Middle Earth, and if he could go there for a day, he would. He has a sword and a staff. He's ready. But I've asked him to come up and explain to us what's happening in this so we get a, a more full picture of, of this video clip and what God is teaching us. Okay, so over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to explain everything you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> so The Lord of the Rings is a sequel. It's the second half of a story that is telling a broader uh, sequence. But the first story is the story of The Hobbit. And the main character of The Hobbit is a character named Bilbo Baggins, who is a hobbit, which means he's a little person. And he uh, went, goes on a grand adventure over the course of that story along with a, a friend who calls him into this adventure, Gandalf, who is a wizard. In the world of Middle Earth, wizards aren't just people who do magic tricks. They're actually angelic beings who are capable of great good or create great harm if they were corrupted. And so Gandalf took him on this great adventure. They had these, uh, they found treasure. There was a dragon. It was great. I'm not going to spoil it. But as a result of this, Bilbo came to be the caretaker of a magical ring. Uh, most of the story of the Lord of the Rings centers on this ring. And I won't tell you the end, even though the story is almost 100 years old. I don't want to spoil it for you. But as he travels with this ring, carrying it for decades, slowly over time, it corrupts him. And the evil of the ring makes him doubt his good friend. And as he's preparing to leave on, uh, to go retire, to go have another adventure, he's deciding, am I going to leave this ring behind or am I going to cling to it? And then he has this encounter with his good friend Gandalf. Isn't that, isn't that odd, Pat? the ring behind, Bilbo. Is that so hard? Well, no. And yes. Now it comes to it. I don't feel like parting with it. It's mine. I found it. It came to me. There's no need to get angry. Well, if I'm angry, it's your fault. It's mine. It's been called that before, but not by you. Oh, my business is of yours when I do with my own thing. I think you've had that ring quite long enough. You want it for yourself? Come on, Baggins! Do not take me for some conjurer of cheap tricks. I am not trying to rob you. I'm trying to help you. All your long years we've been friends. Trust me as you once did. Let it go. See, we can hold on to our old life. That everyday monotonous life, but get a feeling like we own this, it's ours. And we have the monotony and, and the stress of it, but we, we claim this, we like to complain about it. But Jesus says, give it to me. 
And we may not want to, but, but those same words, I'm not coming to rob you, I'm coming to help you. I'm not coming to rob you of life. I'm coming to give you life to its fullest in abundance. And over these next five weeks, we're going to look at what living is abundance to fullness as we live with him as it pertains to time, relationships, money, entertainment, and work. Why? Because God cares about these things. He cares about our everyday walking around life. He wants us to live them to their fullest as we follow him and we are with him. He wants us to know life to its fullest. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to look at time. Lord Jesus, we know that you have not come to rob us of life, but you have come to give us life. You have not come to harm us, but you have come to help us. And Father, there's those here today who are watching or who are listening whose lives feel very mundane and monotonous. And they ask, is there something more? Even those who know you. But Lord, you are saying, I have something more. I have a life of abundance, a life in its fullness for eternity, but also for today. So Lord Jesus, I pray that as we look at your word, you teach us from it, that we may know this life in its fullest. Holy Spirit, empower me to say what you want me to say and empower all of us to hear what you want us to hear so that we may know and follow and live as you call us to, because you have come to give us life. We praise you, Lord. Amen. So if you knew that you only had a month to live, how would you spend your time? You probably wouldn't worry as much about dandelions in your yard or going to the office. You would probably go and want to tell the people that you love how much you love them. You might travel to one of your favorite places you would use your time wisely. One thing is for sure, you wouldn't waste your time. You wouldn't waste it on the mundane things. So my friends, we can't get more time. We have a choice. We can either use it well or we can waste it. And the Lord doesn't want us to waste it. He's given it to us so that we could have life in abundance, life to its fullest. See, living life in abundance will always involve loving God, which is obedience to him, and, and loving others, serving him. Life in abundance can happen anywhere. I'm not saying you don't go to work. No, but you go to work and you can live your life to its fullest at work or at home, or if you are retired, or if you are in school. You can live this life of abundance with our time, as we use our time to do these things. But not just what I have to say. We never gather here just to hear what Rob or Joe have to say. We gather to hear what the Lord has to say. For he is the author and giver of life, the one who gives us a life of abundance. So today we're going to spend time in Ephesians 5, 14 through 21. But it all starts with verse 14. For what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up sleeper and rise up from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. Paul is talking to those that don't know the Lord to say rise from the dead. But he's also talking to those of us that do. But a lot of times we live like we're dead in the monotony of life. We worry about things he tells us not to worry about. He's saying get up. Wake up. You're missing it. Let Christ shine on you. Let him give you life. So what does this look like to live in his abundance to his fullness as it pertains to time as he wakes us up? I'm going to read uh, all the verses we're looking at today, then we'll go through them. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. 
So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So first, verse 15. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise. Get up, sleeper. But don't just start walking. Walk in God's wisdom. James tells us if we lack wisdom, ask him for it and he will give it to us in abundance. We want to walk. In the fear of the Lord, following him as we obey him and love others. We walk in his ways. So he says, wake up, pay attention, walk in his ways. And as you walk in his ways, verse 16, make the most of the time. Make the most of your time here on earth. Our time is short. If you're wondering Pull out pictures of children or grandchildren and see how fast they grow up or maybe even look in the mirror. There's two types of time Scripture speaks about that Paul's addressing here. First is the chronos. This is how we look at time, the space of time, the 24 hours we have in a day. Paul is saying make the most of the 24 hours every minute of the day. Set time, but also the kairos, which is a set time in life, a fit time of life. It's that time, those four years you're in college or elementary school. It's that time where you have young children or that time that Heather and I are in as as new empty nesters. Or it's that time of retirement, making the most of our time. The 24 hours, but also the time of life you're in. But why do we need to pay attention? Why do we have to wisely walk and make the most of our time? Well, Paul says, because the days are evil. My friends, the Lord is coming soon. And time is precious. This is a time to renew your commitment, renew following him, to say, I am no longer want to be caught just in the monotony of life. And though I might go to the same job day after day, I can live life to the fullest in this. I don't want to get trapped, sucked into the things of this world that will guide me away from that, just wanting to get more and more and more things. We need to see how our use of time how we use our time and see how much it looks like the world, which is just the relentless pursuit of trying to get things and hold on to the things that we have and take care of the things that we have versus living life to its fullest in relationship with God following him. So what does it look like for us to use our time the way the Lord wants us to? Paul says, walk in wisdom, don't look like the world, make the most of your time, but we're blessed that he doesn't just leave us there. But he tells us what this looks like for us to use our time the way the Lord wants us to. 5.17, so don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. This is the most important thing that we do as a follower of Christ, understanding what the Lord's will is for us. The first step to making the most of our time is to say, Lord, what do you want me to do with it? Your good, pleasing, and perfect will. Your good, pleasing, and perfect will because he is good. What have you created me for? What have you put me in this time for? What do you want me to spend the next 24 hours doing? What do you want me to be doing during this time of life? We should wake up every day saying, Lord, show me what your will is for me today. Tell me. We start with him, not just with the tasks of the day. I think of this wonderful story from Luke 10. 
While Jesus and the disciples were traveling, he entered a village, and a, man, a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. That is a very unique verse, because a rabbi would only let disciples who he was training for ministry to sit at their feet, and we see he is allowing Mary to sit at his feet. She's listening to his teaching, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. I understand she's sitting at your feet, but Lord, look at all the tasks. The dishes that need to be prepared, the table needs to be set, the water and the wine need to be poured. Tell her to stop listening to you and to get up and help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. Man, how many of us are worried and upset about many things? One thing is necessary. And Mary has made the right choice. And it will not be taken away from her. What was her choice? She wanted to be with Jesus. She wanted to hear what he had to say. To know his will. We get up every morning and we say, Lord, I want to make the most of this time. And the only way I can do that is not my will, but yours. Tell me what you want me to do today. In this space of time, tell me what you want me to do today as I go to class and I go to work. And I wake up to visit my neighbor. Or I spend the day even alone. What do you want me to do today? One thing though is for sure. If you're seeking God's will... You will not find it in escaping. Ephesians 5.18, and don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. Now, Scripture says at one point, and drink a little bit of wine. Paul tells Timothy this if your stomach's upset. There's nothing wrong with having a beer and, and such like that. But what he's saying is don't get drunk. We can't find God's will if we are drunk. Because it dulls our senses. Being drunk is a very selfish thing. Because what you're saying is, I want to dull my senses, not just to what's going on around me, with me, but to everyone else around me. I don't want to care about what anyone else is saying or doing. I want to be numb to it all. I want to escape it all. And when we do that, we make ourselves numb to God. And my friends, Paul is not just saying about uh, avoiding alcohol. We can get drunk and escape in other things, whether it's binge watching a television show or scrolling endlessly on social media or being on the phone with someone for hours just gossiping our way through life or maybe it's through food. Some, it might even be through extensive exercise. What Paul's saying is seek the will of God and don't get stuck in letting other things get in the way because you're not going to hear them. Make the most of your time by seeking the will of God and don't let anything else get in the way. But here's the beautiful thing. Paul isn't seeking to take away our joy and pleasure. But he's saying, be filled with the Spirit. He would say, replace it with something that's better and higher. The fullness of the Spirit. My favorite artist, Stephen Curtis Chapman, in one song, he talks about going through life through the monotony is like sitting and playing video games while standing in the midst of the Grand Canyon or eating candy instead of enjoying the feast that is set out before you. The fullness of the Spirit teaches us to live life to the fullest. Here's a quote. Be filled with the Spirit, not drunkenness, instead of short-lived ecstasy that is destructive. We seek the genuine ecstasy of the Holy Spirit that is creative and upbuilding for us and others. As we do the will of God, as we seek Him, as we seek His Spirit and He empowers us through it, it's not the monotony of life. 
It's his creativity and his building us up through it. I was with a, a good friend the other day, and, and she had attended the youth mission trip two years ago to Knoxville, Tennessee. And she was reminding us of the last day that our, our youth had there. They, it was a fun day. They went down the river on inner tubes. But they had an option to do some other things. But our, our, our kids chose to go back to the mission and have a time of worship. And, and the Spirit of God just filled them at that moment. And they found themselves singing and weeping and on their faces. And it was a time of building the, each of them up as well as, as a group. And it is still uplifting as they talk about it. They were doing the will of God all week and serving others. Seeking God, filled with the Spirit of God. This is how the apostles lived. After the Holy Spirit came down and, 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 and rested upon them and filled them, there were other times throughout the book of Acts where the Spirit empowers them for certain things. So we wake up each day, Lord, show me your will for the next 24 hours in this time of life, as I want to live in the fullness, as I walk with you, I don't want to do things that will separate me from you. I want to see you clearly and fill me and empower me for what you have me to do today as I follow you. And the wonderful thing is as you do that, it doesn't mean it's easy, but he will fill you with hope, peace, and joy. So what does Paul say being filled with the Spirit looks like? What does it look like? Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So the three characteristics of a Spirit-filled person Worshiping together, gathering with others in worship, a heart of worship, being thankful. When we're thankful, we are focused on what God is doing and walking with one another as we seek to love God and love others. My friends, this is exhilarating. The fullness of the Holy Spirit finds manifestation in fellowship when Christians gather together. We gather with others Yes, we have our personal times of prayer and scripture study, but we gather with others who are walking down that same path, seeking God, using their time to, to love God and love others, even in their everyday walking around life. And as we do that, as we pray, as we walk together, the Lord clarifies his will. There have been many times that Pastor Joe and I are out for a walk or going somewhere and we begin to talk and the Lord inspires both of us with the same idea at the same time. And it's just a wonderful thing. And what is the end goal of this? The end goal of making the most of our time finding his will, full of the spirit of God, walking with others, giving thanks. It's to love God and love others by repeating Christ's life in the world. To imitate him in his outpouring of love and forgiveness and sacrificial service to others. And you can do each of those things no matter where you are at. Whether you are visiting a loved one at their home or in the retirement village. Or you're caring for your preschooler. Or if you're going to biology class or if you're going to a club, whether you are going to an office each day, or wherever you work, or if you're retired. Loving God and loving others in those places, following his will for you, knowing that he's put you in those places, you will see him at work. We're called and empowered to be a people who use our time well. Loving God and loving others. By doing so, we'll know what it looks like to live in the abundance of his presence. And to live life to its fullest. So what do I need to think about? And possibly change when it comes to how I view and use time. 
If you thought at any point as you heard us looking at Ephesians 5, man, my life doesn't look like that. Or my life isn't lived to the fullest, I know that. You need to decide today on a few things. Things that we learn from Ephesians 5. First, you are a child of God. And you can live in his abundance. There's nothing that keeps you from living in his abundance. No illness. No amount of money. No job situation. You can live in his abundance. The question is, will you? It's the everyday relationship with him. Second, time is short, my friends. No, it's short. Third, time is not to waste. You can relax. God has given us a day of rest on purpose. Resting is action. Part of living in abundance is finding time to rest. But it's not to waste Time is not to waste, to waste it on the things that don't lead to life in God's abundance and life to its fullest. To know his abundance, we practically need to seek out his will in prayer, in reading, in worship, in gathering with his people. It involves loving God and loving others. To live in abundance, you can try every other way, but you need to start with asking God, as he's the one that gives us the life in abundance, life to its fullest, what is your will for me today? But the great thing is we get to live with joy, filled and empowered by the Spirit. As we walk with him, as he does incredible things around us and with us and through us, and seeing his glory, that's living life to the fullest. Life in abundance is about living God's way with him and knowing him in the midst of it. It's walking alongside him and seeing him do more than we could ask or imagine. He leads us to this life. You need to make the decision today. Do you want to live in the desert and keep trying to find it on your own? Here's the truth. You won't. He with the most toys does not win. He with the most toys is the most burdened. Or you can lay it down and say, I know you have not come to rob me of anything, but to help me. You have not come to steal or kill or destroy my life. You have come to give me life in abundance, walking with you and living this everyday life to the fullest as I await to see you in your fullness, God, when I breathe my last. And it's like living in that green pasture that Psalm 23 speaks about. That even when things get hard, You can still live in the fullness, but you have to choose today. Will you make the most of the time? Let's pray. Holy God, first I pray for those who feel like their life is just a monotony and they're on a merry-go-round and can't get off. And they sit or they hear these words and they say, I want that life in this fullness, but I don't know how to. Because I still have to go to work tomorrow. Lord, I pray that you reveal yourself to them through your spirit. Allow them to wake up, or even at this moment, say, Lord, show me what your will is. And give them opportunities to love you and love others tomorrow and to see you at work. Father, you're the one that gives it to them. So give that to them. Father, for those who are seeking to live in their fullness Reveal your will and empower them. And Father, I pray for this as individuals, but I pray for this as a church as well. That you show us your will for us as Greystone. That we may be a church that uses what you've given us and we live and follow you knowing that you're the one that will bring our church life to its fullest. Lord, sometimes we want to live in the desert and hold on to it. Please take that from us and let us see clearly that you have come to give us life and to help us. We praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As part of what Paul said about worshiping the Lord, giving thanks, we have this opportunity to do this as we sing our final song together. So let us do what Paul calls us to do and stand as one voice and sing, seeking God together.
So Paul says, wake up, sleeper. He has raised us from dead to life. Are we going to live that way? Are we going to live in his fullness, in his abundance, walking with him, him seeking his will, him empowering us to walk beside him and seeing him do more than he could ask or imagine in our everyday walking around lives as we await to be with him in glory? Or we're going to just keep doing what we do. It doesn't lead to life. Only following him does. You must choose today. My friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And may he overflow you with hope regardless of how hard the situation is. May he overflow you with his hope. Till we see him again and just like he promised he's coming back but as we wait let's live life in the fullness seeking his will loving him and loving others amen, amen.